Um, yeah, so the, uh, the introduction mentioned um, a few different areas that I've worked in, um, synaptic plasticity and learning and memory um, earlier on in my career, and then more recently glial biology and particularly my myelination. And this, this particular talk kind of starts to bring together some of those different strands, um, because then ultimately we're going to be talking about how neuronal activity influences the structure of oligodendrocytes and how that might contribute ultimately to um, uh, sort of neural circuit function and plasticity. But um, uh, before we get to that, um, I'm going to uh, just begin by thanking um, everyone at Aurox for inviting me to give this talk. Um, last year I talked about some um, pilot data doing live imaging on myelination. Um, today it's um, more focused on um, some published work that we've published on um, various aspects of how the three-dimensional um, properties of these cells change with um, alterations in neuronal activity. So um, here's a little content of what I'll talk about. We're going to um, cover the sort of background of oligodendrocyte biology very quickly, just to explain what myelination is and why it's important for um, health and disease. Um, we'll move into myelin plasticity, which is a, a more recent idea um, in the field. Um, and I'll explain how we're using organotypic brain slice cultures to image aspects of oligodendrocyte function that are relevant and related to this idea of myelin plasticity. So some of those experiments have been done in cerebellar slice cultures. We'll see quite a lot of that. Um, also some work we've done in the cortical slices as well. So um, I'll present some 3D analysis um, that we've taken from our imaging work um, where we'll be looking at different cells in the lineage. So some of those cells in the oligodendrocyte family are the the precursor cells, the oligodendrocyte precursors, or OPCs. And we'll also look at some more mature cells in the family, the myelinating oligodendrocytes. So just briefly, um, myelination, um, it's the formation of an insulating material on some of the neurons, on some of the axons in the nervous system, and in the brain it's formed by these cells, oligodendrocytes. Myelin is essentially a spiral wrap of specialised membrane that's um, rich in um, a set of lipids and special myelin proteins that can pack down to form a nice insulating material that um, enhances the conduction velocity of action potentials along those myelinated segments. And doing so also increases the fidelity of transmission, so the axon can, can support much higher levels, rates of firing. Myelin can also provide metabolic and trophic support to axons, so it can help um, promote the survival and um, health of those um, underlying axons. And more recently, we've begun to understand how changes in um, myelin, in the structure of myelin, can contribute to circuit activity. And that le leads into this topic of myelin plasticity. So um, up until fairly recently, myelin was thought of a rather inert structure that was um, formed during development and reached a peak some point in sort of young adulthood into middle age and after that point myelin became um, a rather inert and unchanging structure until it began to decline with aging. Um, however research in the early 2000s began to change those views um, leading to the formation of this concept of white matter plasticity um, and the sort of foundational work in this area came from studies of humans um, who were engaged in um, motor skills learning and um, typically sort of activity like learning to play the piano or juggling. Um, in order to investigate this, um, uh, people use functional MRI imaging and particularly diffusion tensor imaging to study uh, the structure of white matter in the brain. And um, this was uh, particularly um, rele relevant when we look at DTI because we're looking at the diffusion of water molecules and um, information on how those diffuse um, and the directions they can diffuse in can give us information about the structure of the environment in which that diffusion is taking place. And in the, in the white matter, where you have a large density of axons all moving or traveling in the same um, orientation, you can get a blockade in, in radial diffusion um, due to the myelin, and that can lead to what we call fractional anisotropy. So if you measure that, you can see whether the white matter has a good structure. And what it was found was, um, for example, this study from the mid 2000s, where they imaged the brains of um, professional piano players. So these people had spent um, hundreds of hours intensively training and learning to play the piano. Um, and as you can imagine with playing the piano, you're 
doing a huge amount of integration. So you're controlling 10 fingers on two hands. Um, you're reading a, a, a score of music and you're listening to the playing as well. So you're integrating all this information. And it turns out that um, certain areas of white matter show um, increases in this fractional anisotropy, which relates to the structure of myelin. So the takeaway message from this type of work the conclusion was that perhaps neuronal activity is regulating that process of myelination. So our experiences and our behavior not only shape synapses in the brain, but also perhaps the myelin that um, insulates the axons. So since that time, a lot of work has been done um, in various different model systems and in vivo to explore how, how myelin is affected by neuronal activity. Um, this schematic will just show you some of those possible um, places where, where um, this neuronal activity can be influencing the oligodendrocyte lineage. So we can see different cells in this lineage. We've got oligodendrocytes, the mature cells that are myelinating axons, and we've got the OPCs, those immature cells. Now those OPCs are, um, have a nice complex structure of fine processes that help them to migrate through the nervous system and locate targets to myelinate and they can contact axons. And it turns out some research from the early 2000s that these um, OPC contacts with axons actually um, involve um, synapses. So they can listen into um, neuronal activity um, and that may then influence their function. And not only are they receiving these synaptic inputs, but also the um, in vitro studies have shown that AMPA receptors can regulate other OPC functions such as migration. So clearly, um, neuronal activity is set up to influence the, the structure, the shape of these cells via these sorts of interactions. And the shape of these cells is very much related to their function, their migration, and their contact with potential targets. And that's illustrated really nicely with this confocal image on the left here, which is taken from a review um, by Arthur Butt in 2005. And you can see there's an OPC labeled in green, and it makes these complex interactions with a with a whole set of axons arranged in three dimensions. You can see all those little contacts between the OPC processes and the axons with that surface rendering. So OPCs function in a complex three-dimensional environment and their morphology is closely related to their function. So we wish to study um, OPCs and how they were influenced by neuronal activity. Um, and we chose to do that in cerebellar slice cultures. And the reason we chose slice cultures is they, they provide that nice three-dimensional structure, um, the environment in which the OPCs are functioning. It also retains a lot of the cellular components of the brain organized in the same architecture. So you have the astrocytes, you have microglia, the different types of oligodendrocytes, and also vessels, endothelial cells, other constituents of the brain. So they're all there and they're intact for the most part. And you can actually um, undertake some really useful kind of pharmacological studies on these slices, these living slices. So you can perform chronic manipulations of whatever physiological process you're interested in. It might be neuronal activity in this case. Um, and all, importantly, these slice cultures provide a really good way to access and image regions of the brain that might not be accessible with in vivo imaging methods, such as cranial window and two photon where you might be restricted to the more superficial layers of the cortex. So slice cultures have a lot of advantages, but of course there are some limitations as well. So we might consider the fact that these are in vitro systems in, a, in culture conditions, so they'll be very much influenced by um, whatever you put into your, into your culture medium. But perhaps more importantly, you're gonna lose a lot of long range connections that are lost when you're slicing. So really you can look at things in the local environment, but um, understanding how this system is going to interact with the wider brain is beyond this kind of in vitro slice system. So I'll introduce the cerebellar slices we're using. This is a, a really good system because you have this very well organized um, area of the cerebellar cortex. Principally, you have your white matter that passes through the cerebellar cortex. And this is where you have a high density of axons that originate from these Purkinje cells that are lined up in the, Bikinji, in the Bikinji layer here, which borders with the granule cells. So Bikinji cells project their axons into the white matter. And then there's a whole population of oligodendrocytes in that tissue that can myelinate those axons. Now, if we make these slice cultures from early um, mouse pups, 
we put them into culture, the oligodendrocytes in those slices continue to function, they continue to differentiate and to myelinate, and we, we know that because we can examine that with various methods. So for example, we can stain the tissue and we can see the progression of myelination. So this is a stain for myelin basic protein. It's labeling um, a key protein in myelin. And you can see that as we get later and later into the culture, the, um, the myelin progresses and becomes more extensive. We can also see interactions between oligodendrocytes and axons. So here we can stain for a neurofilament and an axonal marker. And we can see that the oligodendrocytes um, interact with that marker really nicely. But we can also um, do some live imaging to prove that the oligodendrocytes are functioning and can be studied in real time. So in our lab, we have a confocal, spinning disc confocal, which is um, operating with um, some of the technology that was developed by Orox. But this was in the days before they began to sell whole systems. So this is essentially the sort of forerunner of the, of the Clarity system. And uh, it was marketed by Andor. And we've got a system here where we can put slice cultures on the microscope and image them in an environment chamber shown in the bottom right. And the nice thing about these slices is because they're sitting in the same environment they would in the incubator, they remain viable. And you can do some very nice long term live time lapse imaging. Um, we can image a reporter mouse we have, which has got a DS red protein expressed under a myelin promoter, the PLP promoter. And so using this approach, you can see in this movie with a time lapse of about 30 hours, you can see the transgene begins to increase in its expression and begins to fill out and illuminate those processes which are um, aligning up with axons in the white matter. So that was an image, a time lapse image taken from uh, the corpus callosum of a neocortical slice culture. And we can analyze these, um, these traces as well from the confocal time lapse. So we can pick out and identify those growing is growing um, myelin segments that have been labeled by the DS red. So all of these processes are ongoing in brain slices. So they provide a very nice system to both see how myelination is progressing and intervene uh, with various um, manipulations that you can hypothesize will affect the oligodendrocytes. So in our case, we were interested in studying how OPC morphology would be affected by neuronal activity. So to do that, we used a recombinant viral vector to, to deliver a farnesylated GFP to the OPCs. And we used the, the SFE, semi-leaky forest vector. The reason for this is it gives a very rapid transfer into neurons and glia and very high levels of transgene expression. Now we used a subtype, the A774, which version which infects OPCs quite nicely and you can See that because we can label those OPCs of the classic OPC marker um, NG2. So when we drop um, SFE onto the top of the slice, it labels OPCs near the surface. And here's a nice example of a well isolated cell, um, which we can then use to study its morphology. We know it's an OPC because it's labeled with this surface marker NG2. So using this approach, we can study the morphology of APCs in these slices um, under different conditions. So the particular experiment I'll present here, the slices were cultured for six days. And then on the sixth day, we applied drugs. Now, um, the drugs we applied were either TTX, tetrodotoxin, to block neuronal activity and shown with the pufferfish, or we used the drug called GYKI, which blocks AMPA receptors. Because remember, I said before that AMPA receptors are expressed on these cells and actually uh, are involved in moving synaptic signals that allow the OPCs to pick up on neuronal activity. So after um, a day of those drugs, we then applied the SFE label to label up the OPCs. We also then fixed the slices 24 hours later and stained them for the OPC mark NG2. And then did confocal imaging on double, double positive cells, the OPCs labeled with the membrane tethered GFP. Those cells are then traced um, from the confocal stacks. So you can see an example of that here. Here we go through a confocal stack from a cell. It's expressing GFP, and then you can see the reconstruction appearing. As it rotates, you can appreciate its complexity and its three dimensions. So the colors there relate to different process arbors. So those are all of the nodes and segments connected with a single origin from the cell body. So we can make these reconstructions and then those can be analyzed to understand uh, some of the complexity of the cells. 
So in this experiment, we used TTX and uh, GYKI. Here you can see an example of a control OPC. It has quite a complex morphology, very nice, finely branching processes. And as I said before, you can imagine these cells are, are uh, seeking out targets, axons that they want to, to myelinate. Here's uh, the reconstruction from that cell. Again, you can see um, the processes and the, uh, the, the different branch points are shown by spheres. The cell, the cell body is shown in the red circle. Now, if we look at the uh, TTX treated cells, we can see that they are less complex and more compact. Um, the processes appear to be shorter and there may be fewer branches. Now, this is also true for the slices that were treated with the AMPA receptor bucket. So we can quantify that. Um, what we found was a total process length were reduced by these treatments and also the complexity of the process arbors. So uh, the number of branch points that the cells had as well, both reduced. So it seems blocking activity or blocking AMPA receptor function produced profound effects on the function, on the shape of these cells. How would that affect their function as well? So another measurement we looked at was differentiation. So uh, we measured differentiation by double staining. So we marked OLIG2, which is a label for all of the cells in the lineage. And we also labeled this CC1, which only labels the differentiated members of the oligodendrocyte family. And um, we found that TTX robustly increased the number of oligodendrocytes that are differentiated. And GYKI also had a similar effect. Uh, which you can see in this quantification of the cells. So interestingly, um, we found an increase in differentiation when we blocked neuronal activity. So based on this, we might expect that we would see an increase in myelination as well. When you block activity, more mature oligodendrocytes should mean more, more myelination. But in fact, this isn't what we found. So when we stained for myelin basic protein and neurofilament and co-localized the signals, we found reductions in myelination, um, which wasn't our expectation. But now putting this together, it might make some sense. So if we think about um, an increase in differentiation, we would have expected an increase in myelination. But now if we consider the morphological data that we got from the OPCs, we saw a reduction in their, in their structural development. Um, fewer, shorter processes, less complex, which suggests that those processes may have um, be impeded and unable to interact and contact enough targets to myelinate. So um, actually you begin to see that it makes sense that if you impede the morphological structure of these cells, then you might inf interfere with myelination. So perhaps neuronal activity guides the appropriate maturation of APCs. We also studied um, mature olig oligodendrocytes as well, the myelinating forms. And to do this, instead of dropping the virus on top of the slices, you inject it uh, into the tissue itself. So an example of that is shown on the left from that so bright field image of a, of a cerebellar slice. And we've injected into the, into the white matter shown by the arrows. And you get this nice pattern of um, cells lined up um, in rows with their processes all lined up. And you can imagine that these are myelinating oligodendrocytes whose processes are all lined up with the flow of axons through this white matter. Now we know these are oligodendrocytes not only because of their morphology, but also because they're expressing um, myelin proteins such as MDP. So we have myelinating oligodendrocytes and we can, uh, we can get individual um, reconstructions of these cells and we can study their morphology. So here you can see some examples. So the types of things that we could analyze might include uh, the number of process arbors. So again, you've got process arbors, this process arbor all in the green, all extends from a single primary branch. Um, we could count the number of branches on these cells. And we can also study a, an important feature of oligodendrocytes themselves, which are the, the internodes, the, um, the myelin segments, which in our hands we analyzed by looking for thickened um, linear structures that were connected to fine connecting branches. Class, uh, sort of typical of, a, of an internode. So we can count and measure the length of these putative internodes. Um, and we can also look at, see what branches are myelinating, which ones aren't and what the ratios are. So we did an analysis of the morphology of these cells. Um, and broadly, we found that the morphology was quite similar between the groups, those treated with con those controls and those with neuronal activity blocks. But um, we also saw some interesting differences. So we saw a, a general increase in the total number of branches, 
um, or at least a trend for that in the TTX treated group. But conversely, we also saw that the number of branches that seem to be associated with um, an internode, so involved in myelination, seem to be reduced. So it seems that activity may channel the growth and um, structure of these cells towards the production of internodes, because when we block neuronal activity, we see more branches, but fewer associated with an internode. Um, perhaps more importantly, though, we discovered that the actual length of internodes was quite strongly reduced in the TTX treated groups. So it seems that um, activity may encourage the lengthening of internodes. So what does this mean in, in the context of um, myelin plasticity and circuit function? So we could imagine a scenario where you may have oligodendrocytes that are myelinating different axons. We know that an individual oligodendrocyte can myelinate uh, a large number of different axons. And here in this particular example, we've got a cell myelinating um, two axons. Has a one, on one axon, we have a longish internode, which would produce quite fast conduction. And on this axon, we have a smaller internode that will be um, therefore slower conducting in this area. Now, if we have the right pattern of activity on this axon here, then this may stimulate um, lengthening or growth of that internode to speed up the conduction of that axon. And perhaps that could then lead to faster conduction and help to coordinate firing. So in a way, we may begin to see how um, sort of activity dependent myelination could contribute to the regulation of activity across circuits and provide a complement to synaptic plasticity. So I'm going to stop there. That's, that's really um, where our in vitro studies have taken us. We can see that um, activity can influence the function and the, straight, the shape of these cells, these oligodendrocytes and their OPCs. Um, and I just wanted to briefly mention that we've got a workshop at Birmingham, which is demonstrating various different slice culture and explant models that you can use in biomedical research. Um, and so we're going to be demonstrating all these different systems, including some of the mouse brain uh, cultures that I use. And there'll be some opportunities to see different types of applications on these um, model systems. So if you're interested, do visit that website and take a look. And I just want to acknowledge the people that have helped with this research. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, so if anybody has any questions, do type them in the chat. We'll be looking for them there. Um, in the meantime, I was asking, wanted to ask you about um, how, how thick are the cell cultures that you need to be looking at here? So these, uh, the slices start out at 350 uh, microns and then over about a week in culture, they really, um, um, they sort of mature and they thin out until uh, by the time we're imaging them, they're probably about 150 microns in thickness. And are you imaging across that whole thickness? Um, we probably get a depth of about 50 to 60 microns with the microscope that we have, with the GFP labels. Mm -hmm. So certainly not the full thickness. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm asking this for my own interest in uh, aberration correction, whether you actually see any problems there, which might be solved, <coughs> Excuse me. Which might be solved by, um, by, by that particular um, addition of that particular technology. Because mm -hmm. that was... I was related to my follow-up question, which was um, the uh, you know what further microscope capabilities might actually assist with this research. I would, I would say, from a technical point of view, the ability to um, run multiple samples uh, in the same microscope, so you can have uh, more efficiencies, because the live imaging experiments are very exciting, but they're very, as you can imagine, a thirty-hour time lapse. Yeah. on one sample it's it's a it's a challenge to to build up um, replications and test different treatments so multiple multiple imaging on different samples at the same time would be it's not really an optical situation it's more yeah. of a it's implementation the robotics and automation aspects of it yeah yeah so i think it's good questions coming in here so probably related to this actually Philip's asking how long can you keep these cell cultures alive for and would these samples stay alive in a multi-well plate yeah, so um, we can keep them for several weeks in the incubator, um, maybe a month, up to a month. Um, the system, it will reach a point where it just runs out of steam and degenerates a little bit, but um, certainly up to a month. On the microscope, um, the most I've done is 
two to three days. So I haven't um, needed or wanted to keep them any longer than that, but um, perhaps with the right in conditions. In terms of multi-wells, um, we've tried a little bit with um, eight well chamber slides and trying to set up, because what I didn't explain there is that these, these slices have grown on, this, on these culture in inserts that fit into a six well plate. So it's sort of typical 35 mil dish width. And, um, you know, to make something more multi-well, a multi-well format, you need a, to shrink down that insert. So that's like a, um, a bit of a challenge. Try to do that, but it hasn't led to the sort of stability that we get with the, with the commercial inserts. Okay. And there's a question from Oriane. Um, says, thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering if the activity dependent change in oligodendrocyte morphology can be explained by a change in axonal length. Hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's an int intriguing suggestion. We haven't measured um, the, the neurons to see what's happening to axonal morphology. Um, no, I, that's, that's a good question and, and um, perhaps one that we need to think about. But at this point, we don't really have an answer to that. Other than, I suppose, there's a lot of different, uh, I mean, I, I presented this data from our own work, but then there's quite a lot of work in the field showing similar effects and using similar methods. So it seems that these morphological changes with, with the myelinating oligodendrocytes is quite, is quite a, a robust effect. Okay, we have another question here from Bob Hartley. Does activity affect myelin synthesis? Yes, it does. So um, there's, there's a lot of evidence that MVP genes are affected by neuronal activity and um, certainly um, the MVP gene is affected. So um, you would imagine that other myelin genes are likely to be affected as well. Yeah. I suppose in response to one of the earlier questions, uh, Lee's just pointing out that our unity has a, our Oxy's unity has a holder for two side by side three millimetres, 35 millimetres Petri dishes and also is incubated with tile scans and time lapse. So maybe that's useful for somebody. Maybe uh, that's a, that maybe it'd be interesting to see if uh, if Orox wants to uh, uh, bring one of those along to the workshop and we could try it out. I'm sure they'll look into that. Okay, uh, I think we've had some good questions there. Thank you very much uh, to, to Daniel for, for that. And um, I'm sure everybody will be applauding quietly in their, in their rooms. We can't hear them. <laughs>